all. Welcome to the video. Today we're going to be looking at section 4.5 where we're going to be solving polynomial equations. So some of the things that uh, one of the questions that we're going to want to answer is how can we determine whether a polynomial equation has a repeated solution. So here's how we can kind of determine that. So let's look at let's look at this example here. So they're they're asking us to solve this equation 2x cubed minus 12x squared plus 18x. So in the past when we were solving polynomial equations, we just like today and, and every other one that we're trying to solve for, we're going to set the equation equal to zero. Reason for that is essentially when you are solving, you're not only just finding the zeros of the function, but you're also finding the x-intercepts. of the function. Anything that is an x-intercept is considered a real solution. Now, to determine how many possible x-intercepts or zeros a particular equation has, you have to look at the largest degree. So here, it says that I have a degree of 3. That means that there is the possibility of having at least three real solutions. So we go about solving. It's already set equal to 0. That's great. So in order to solve this, we need a factor. I look here. I notice that every single term is divisible by 2, so I'm going to put 2 to the outside because you have to factor it out completely. And each one of the values has an x, so I'm going to put that to the outside. So 2x is my greatest common binomial factor for this particular situation. So what's left over is going to be x squared minus 6x plus 9, set that equal to 0. Okay, so here we have 2x, and I get to factor this, so parentheses, parentheses, set equal to 0. It's x and x, same sign, both of them will be minus. Two values that give me a product of 9, and their sum is 6, is 3 and 3. Zero product property tells me that x will equal 0 in this situation, x will equal 3, and x is equal 3. All right. So this is an example of an equation, a polynomial equation having a repeated solution. So if you look here, this is solution 1, this is solution 2, and this is solution 3. But since 3 is the same, it's repeated, you only got to use one of them. So you're your x-intercept is x equals 0 and x equals 3. So how you determine if something is a repeated solution is your uh, you have a square of a binomial. So anytime you have a square of a binomial, you are going to have a repeated solution. So if we look at... Uh, Question one here, looks like we got set equal to zero already. Four, 40, and 36 are all divisible by four, so I'm gonna put four to the outside. And they do not have um, a common variable, so what's left over is gonna be x to the fourth minus 10x squared plus 9, set that equal to 0. 
Okay, so here you got you got your four, and you have factor out x to the fourth minus 10x squared plus nine. So this is a situation where it's like a simple trinomial, but because it's to the fourth power, it's actually gonna be x squared here and x squared here. Plus nine means the signs are the same, minus 10 means they're both subtraction. And are there two values that give me a product of, product of nine and their sum is 10, Yes, 9 and 1, because 9 times 1 is 9, 9 plus 1 is 10. Now we have a situation where x squared minus 9 and also x squared plus 1 are sum and difference patterns. So I got this 4 here, and then I got x plus 3 times it by the quantity of x minus 3, and then x squared minus 1 would be factored as x plus 1 times by the quantity of x minus 1. 4 doesn't have any variables, so I don't have to waste my time using the zero product property there. So x plus 3, zero product property is going to be negative 3 here. It's going to be positive 3 here. x equals negative 1 in this situation, and x equals positive 1. 1, 2, 3, 4 solutions. It makes sense because it's raised to the fourth power and you can leave it like those four solutions or you could write it as x equals plus or minus three and x equals plus or minus one all right either way it uh, I'll accept both ways of answering I would encourage you to look at now let's just do number two. Let's so in this situation it's not set equal to zero, so let's make it equal to zero. So it's going to be two x to the fifth minus fourteen x cubed plus twenty four x, and that's set equal to zero. So I just place it in standard form. Two, fourteen, twenty four, all divisible by two. They all share a variable of x. So I got two x that would go to the outside this would then be x to the fourth minus 7x squared plus 12 set that equal to zero so drop down the 2x can i factor this let's see parentheses parentheses set that equal to zero this is going to be x squared and x squared, same sign minus. Are there two values that give me a product of 12, but their sum is 7? And 3 and 4. So keep in mind, you're going to have up to five solutions in this case. So zero product property here, set so equal to 0, x is going to be 0. That's Pretty straightforward. Over here, this one's going to be x squared minus 3 set equal to 0. And this is going to be x squared minus 4 set equal to 0. Well, when I add 3 to both sides, I have x squared equals 3. So in order to get x by itself, i got to take the square root of both sides. So x is essentially now going to equal both positive and negative square root of 3. Same thing goes here. If I add 4, I get x squared equals 4. Take the square root of both sides. x will then equal both the positive and negative 2. I have two answers, negative 2, positive 2. I have two answers here, negative square root of 3 and positive square root of 3, and I have 0. So I have five solutions for this equation. One of the core concepts that we're going to be looking at in this section is being able to determine the possible zeros 
of a function or possible x-intercepts of a function. Sometimes it's not as easily found um, because in some instances it's, it may be challenging to factor them. So there is a possibility of getting the possible zeros, all right? Not every single one of them is going to be a, 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 an answer, but it is the possibility of them being a solution. How you determine that is they say they're using the variables p over q. p in this particular instance stands for the factor, the factors of constant value in terms of a naught. So this is the, the whatever the whatever value at the end of the function that has no variable, find the factors of them. And remember, it's both the positive and the negative. On the bottom, denoted with the variable q, is the factors of the lead coefficient. So whatever your lead degree is, put the number, find the factors of them, and again, it's both positive and negative. Okay. So here is an example of kind of what I want you to do in order to kind of find these solutions. So here I want you to find all the real solutions of x cubed minus 8x squared plus 11x plus 20. All right, so the possible solutions comes from, so you gotta find the factors of, of 20 over the factors of the lead coefficient, which is one. So this one is isn't so bad because you know you, you don't have to take the fraction. So all you really have to do is find the factors of twenty. So it's going to be plus or minus one, plus or minus twenty, plus or minus two, plus or minus ten. Three is not. Four is plus or minus four and plus or minus five. So plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus four, plus or minus five, plus or minus 10, plus or minus 20. Those are the possible solutions. Now, my expectation is you don't check each one of these and try to formulate an answer. You can do one of two things. If you have the graphing calculator, I advise you to use it to make kind of an, a hypothesis on what what, what it's going to be. And really, all you can, really got to find is one or or even all of them. So, but, so if you're trying to find all of them, I'm just going to type in x to the third minus 8x squared plus 11x plus 20. And so I graph that. And by looking at it, it looks like I see negative 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So negative 1, 4, and 5. So right now, I write in, jotting those down, but just giving me those numbers because you looked at it on the graphing calculator doesn't prove anything. So in order to prove these, we have to use synthetic division. So I'm going to take the first one, and I'm going to go negative 1. I'm going to go here, 3, 2, one constant, there's nothing missing, so I'm just going to write in the coefficients of 1, negative 8, 11, and 20. And if negative 1 is a solution, at the end, it should be 0. So let's see if it works. 1, negative 1 times, so that's negative 1, so that's negative 9, times this, it becomes 9. And then this becomes 20 times by negative 1 is negative 20, and I get a 0. So now that I got that 0, I know that negative 1 is in fact a solution. If it is not, then you have to try another one. But when it is, 
what you can do is you can kind of do the synthetic division right down the line. Now I, I can use the terms 1, negative 9, and 20 for my next uh, possible solution to prove it. All right. Could you use go back and use 1, negative 8, 11, and 20 and do it all over again? Absolutely. But this just shortens uh, the number of values that you have to multiply and add to. So I'm going to check the next one. So that's 4. And I go here, drop down the 1, times that by 4. So I get 4. This becomes negative 5. It becomes negative 20. This becomes 0. I get my 0. It checks out. So 4 is a solution. Next one I got to look at is 5. So now I go 5. And again, remember, you can only keep going with the numbers that you reached as long as you keep getting zeros from the previous solution value. So drop down the 1, times that by 5. I get a 0, checks off. So I have a third degree polynomial, and I have three solutions. And I was able to prove it using synthetic division. All right. So if you look at at this one again, I'm not gonna I'm not going to go into possible solutions. Let's see what we what we can do in order to find all the real zeros. So if we go into our graphing calculator and graph it up, I got 10 x to the fourth minus 11 x to the third minus 42 x to the second plus 7 x plus 12 and then graph it. All right, so it appears that uh, All right, so it looks like not Every single one of them is, or I'm not sure if any of them are going to be integers per se, but uh, maybe fractions. So if you look at like right in here, it appears that it's in between 0 and negative 1. So could it be negative 1 half? Possibly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put down a negative 1 half as a possible solution. So, okay, let's let's give it a try. So, use my synthetic division. I got 4, 3, 2, 1 constant, so we're good to go here. So, it's going to be 10, negative 11, negative 42, positive 7, and 12. So, let's see if we get a 0. So, we got 10 times that by negative 1 half, I get a negative 5. Add those together, I get negative, what, 16. Multiply that, we get positive 8. Add those together, I get negative 34. Multiply that, I get, what, positive, what, 17. Uh, add those together, I get, what, 24. Multiply that by negative 1 half, I get a negative 12 and I get 0. Okay, so I check that off. Now, here's the thing is in this particular instance, you know, you could try to find another value, which, you know, nothing wrong with that, or you could now take this four term polynomial and solve it all right so my my advice is to try to see if i can find another one let me try to zoom back out again all right 
right? So zoom in. Let's try to go. positive one is right there and we'll click enter to see what happens there. Looks like we got what? That's one. That's two. You know it's a little tricky to see. Oh, let's see here. So if I go on the left side, so that's one looks like maybe negative one half, so it'd be what negative three halves. Let's give that a try. So drop down the ten. Uh, ten times so negative three halves times ten is what negative fifteen. Add that by negative sixteen, I get negative thirty one. Times that by negative three halves. It gives me um, what, 46 and a half plus negative 34. So now I got 12 and a half times that by negative 1.5. So I get what negative eighteen point seven five and twenty-four minus eighteen point seven five is what five and a quarter. So that means that one half is not not a solution. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this and see if I can factor it. So I got so this is constant x to the first, x to the second, x to the third. So I got 10 x to the third minus 16 x squared minus 34 x plus 24. So here's what we got. So if I, I get, so I get what, 10 and 16, they're both what, 2. So if I go 2 and then x, this is going to be 5x minus all these squares, so minus 8. And then I subtract it, let's see. 34 divided by 2 is, that doesn't work. Hmm. Let's see what we can do. All right, I think I might have got something. Let's try a different approach. So here I still have that 10 x to the third minus 16 x squared minus 34 x plus 24. Those are all values that are divisible by 2. So let's keep that in mind. So this is going to be 5x cubed minus 8x squared minus 17x plus 12. So from here, you could type this in as in your graph and see what you come up with. Let's give that a try. 5x to the third minus 8x to the second minus 7 x plus 12. Graph that. Let's 
So now, looking at the standard, so this is where you would probably want to attempt to try to use one of the possible solutions. So that P over Q situation, here you're going to have plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 5, plus or minus 6, plus or minus 12, divided by plus or minus 1, plus or minus 5. All right. Now, looking at, uh, so if I zoom in, it looks like It looks like you have something that's like a little bit larger than one half. So you could have something like four fifths or three fifths. All right, let's give positive three fifths a try. So if I put three fifths in here and wrote down five, negative eight, negative 17, and 12. So I get five here, this becomes three multiply this, I get, or add that, I'm sorry, I get negative 5, multiply that, I get 3, oh, I'm sorry, I get negative 3, which then gives me negative 20, and then 3 fifths times it by negative 20, gives me negative 12 and that's zero so that checks out so I got lucky so we have two solutions and we have to see if we can find two more so if I wrote this as 5x squared minus 5x minus 20 here's the deal with this you can't factor this so the only way that you can go about solving these last two equations is by implementing the quadratic formula you know, this being A, this being B, and this being C. You know, we got the opposite of B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. And we can go through the whole thing. I'm going to tell you what the answers are. It's going to be 1 plus the square root of 17 all divided by 2, comma, 1 minus the square root of 17 all divided by 2. And if you're looking at this in decimal form, this would be like 2.56, and this one would be like negative 1.56. So I got 1, 2, 3, 4 answers. The last thing that we're going to look at is being able to uh, write um, a polynomial function by knowing what the uh, zeros are. But if for some reason we are given an irrational um, value, we have to use what is called the irrational conjugate, which means that any time you have some kind of square root, you're going to use both the positive and negative of that. Reason for so is once you multiply it all out through um, through the multiplication, eventually the the irrational uh, square roots will go away. And then I'll show you what that looks like. So here it says write a polynomial function of least degree that is rational coefficients and the lead coefficient is one and the zeros are three and two plus the square root of five so here's the thing this one here is pretty straightforward 
to know that if you have a function that has any integer, all you're going to do is you're going to take x minus whatever that integer is. So it's going to be x minus 3. When you look at the ones that have the irrational uh, term in it, now you have to implement that irrational conjugates theorem. So for this one, you're going to have x minus, and I'm just going to put it in parentheses, 2 plus the square root of 5. And then you're going to get another one where you have to put the negative. So then it's going to be x minus 2 minus the square root of 5. And then you just multiply those three, and you're going to get your polynomial function. So to start, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get all these two parentheses uh, sort of eliminated and then do some grouping. So I'm going to leave this x minus 3 alone for a little while. And I'm just going to write this as x minus 2 minus the square root of 5. And then this one's going to be x minus 2 plus the square root of 5. So all I did was just distribute that negative over that set of parentheses. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new grouping. I'm going to group these two together. The reason for that is, oh, I had the exact same thing here and the exact same thing here. What this is going to create is essentially a sum and difference pattern because I have a minus right here and a plus right here. So x minus 3 stays the same. This is now going to be x minus 2 quantity squared minus square root of 5 times square root of 5 is going to be positive 5. So what that did was just get, it got rid of the radical. From here, I can use our square of a binomial formula. So this is now going to be x minus 3. This is going to be expanded as x squared minus 4x plus 4 minus 5. I have like terms there and there, so this is now going to be x squared, or I'm sorry, just x minus 3 times about the quantity of x squared minus 4x minus 1. To finish up, now we just multiply those two sets of parentheses. So I'm just going to take this x, multiply it by these three here, so that gives me x to the third minus 4x squared minus x. Finish with that. Take the negative 3 minus 3x squared plus 12x plus 3. x cubed is there. I got squares here and here, so that's minus 7x squared. Done, done. This becomes plus 11x here and here. And I get plus 3. So my function with those zeros is going to be x cubed minus 7x squared plus 11x plus 3. And we're not going to go through this whole thing, but I just want to show you how you set it up. And if you want to go ahead and keep going with it, that's great. So my 0 is 4, so it's going to be x minus 4. I set this thing up as x minus, and then parentheses, 1 minus the square root of 5. And then I'm going to take as x minus, and then parentheses, 1 plus the square root of 5. And if you so choose to go through it, you should get a value of x cubed minus 6x squared plus 4x plus 16. If you don't and you're having questions, please leave a comment down below. I'm more than happy to help. And that is being able to solve polynomial equations. Hope this helps. Until next time.